We're really excited to have all of you joining again on a Friday evening, at least in the European time zone, this meeting. Uh, before we get started, just a few quick words. So we'll be talking about um, AutoML and R and Python, and we have the fantastic Aaron Liddell with us today, who will walk us through how to do it in both platforms of both programming languages. And who are we? That's probably also interesting for you, because why should we talk about both R and Python in one meeting? It's actually because we're PyLadies and R-Ladies, and we favor the, 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 the beauty of both languages. And the idea of this joint series that we are running, and that has now the fourth or fifth meeting already, with a steadily growing um, group of participants and people who are interested in the meeting, kind of confirms that both communities are beautiful and that there is a need to bridge them both. And we are Pi Ladies Paris, Our Ladies Paris with Mumina, and Our Ladies Cologne with me and Paulina. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Aaron, who will walk us through the, the evening or the late night session tonight. Thank you. I will share my screen now and I'll make this big. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is a good, great opportunity to be able to talk about um, H2O because it is a library that's in both R and Python, um, which I think is pretty unique in the machine learning space. Um, so it's always a, a great opportunity to bring the two uh, wonderful communities together, our ladies and pie ladies, which as most of you know, I'm a big fan of, of both. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how to do AutoML um, using the H2O package in R and Python. Um, so here's kind of the overall agenda. Um, we're going to take a break, I think, halfway through to do a little bit of Q&A, and I'll let the hosts kind of decide when we should do that. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about what is AutoML, and then I'm going to talk specifically what is H2O AutoML, which is our own version of that. Um, and there's another sort of small topic I'll cover, which is automatic explainability. So that's another thing that's sort of part of the H2O package. And then uh, something I'm really excited about is there's two new software packages that, that I'll be able to talk about today, uh, one in R and one in Python. Um, so something for everybody here, and that's the Agua package, which is the new uh, package by um, our studio slash POSIT that is in basically brings H2O into the tidy models um, space. And I'll show you uh, some links to that and just a very high level overview. Um, and then another new thing is a new sort of GUI or like a web GUI for H2O AutoML, which is um, written in something, uh, a frame that's, that's by H2O, which is open source called Wave. And um, it's actually in R, Wave is an R and a Python um, framework, but uh, the one that I've uh, written H2O AutoML Wave app in is actually in Python. So um, I will show you both of those as well. And I will try to cover a lot of <clears throat> stuff today. So I might kind of just go a little bit fast through some things. Um, and I just wanna really just cover a lot of um, different topics. And you know, if you wanna then delve further into them, I have all sorts of links and documentation. Um, so really I'm just trying to give you a broad overview of all the things that, that are sort of related to this topic. <clears throat> okay. Um, oopsies, there we go. Um, <clears throat> oops, sorry, <laughs> I meant to delete that slide. Um, okay, so intro to automatic machine learning. So first of all, you might ask like, why, why would we do AutoML or what is the point of this? Um, so really just in a very simple um, statement, basically there's something called the, the no free lunch theorem, which is um, essentially, a statement that that all algorithms are equivalent when averaged over all problems. So 
really what that's saying is that there's no single best algorithm. So it's always going to be dependent on your data set, um, what you're trying to measure, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> that's why we want to do something called AutoML, which is it's really just uh, trying to find the best the best model for any particular data set. And that might mean looking at a lot of different algorithms. Um, and so AutoML is kind of a process by which we can automatically sort of scan and test out a bunch of different algorithms to get the best um, model. Um, so yeah, just to, to summarize. So one of the goals I would say of AutoML is to train the best model in the least amount of time. And by that, um, we can talk about two types of time. So one is developer time. So how long does it take you to actually write the code to get the best model? Um, if you don't have something like an AutoML, you're going to be writing a lot of code to try a lot of different models yourself. Um, and then also the amount of time that you're training. It's also good to minimize that for lots of reasons. Um, it helps you iterate faster if you can do things more quickly, uh, helps you do a lot more problems in, the, in a smaller amount of time. Um, if you're like paying for server time, it can also just be cheaper. So that's kind of some of the goals. And um, one of the other nice things about AutoML is that it kind of um, <clears throat> reduces the amount of expertise that's required to do um, sort of good machine learning. So if you're a newer data scientist and you don't know all the different algorithms yet, you're still learning, you don't, maybe you know some of the algorithms, but you don't know all the hyperparameters and how to tune them. Um, that That's when AutoML is gonna be really uh, useful. Um, but I like to say this, this is a tool for both experts and novice uh, data scientists because, um, you know, experts, you know, there's, after you've been doing this for many, many years, there's really nothing you know, to be gained by rewriting the same code over and over again to do your grid searches or hyperparameter tuning. It's, you know, very fun in the beginning, but then it kind of gets tedious. So uh, that's something that might appeal to experts is that you don't have to keep writing the same code over and over again. You can just quickly throw AutoML at a new data set and then kind of iterate from there. And um, another nice thing about AutoML is it kind of, um, it can, it can kind of increase reproducibility. So if you have kind of a very complicated data pipeline and modeling process, that can be hard to reproduce. Um, so if you have it just tightly uh, written into a single function, um, it's kind of hard to mess that up. So let me you set a different seed and you get different results, but that's pretty much um, one, one other nice thing about AutoML. <clears throat> and I also see a use for it in, in scientific applications. If you, you know, have a new science problem and you want to see, you know, maybe machine learning has never been used on that problem before, um, it might be just great to use an AutoML tool at the beginning because you, you know, maybe there's no historical um, uh, evidence that like certain algorithms work better than others. So it's just a really good tool for a new problem as well. Um, so. I think you can kind of split um, AutoML up but kind of by the different parts of the data science uh, pipeline. So that would be like data prep and then uh, model generation. So usually, you know, it takes a number of different experiments or, or models being trained to kind of come to the best model. Um, uh, there is kind of research that sort of in the AutoML space that is more geared towards predicting what would be the best hyperparameters so that you don't actually have to do that search. But that's all very new. Um, but I do see that that might be um, a direction that AutoML might um, be heading towards in the future, just to save time. Um, and then once you have a bunch of models, another thing that you can do to improve the performance is to ensemble either all of those together or some of them. Um, if your goal is strictly to get the best model in terms of model performance, that's always going to be something that uh, should help you. Um, it definitely adds to complexity. So it's if that's not um, what you're looking for, you don't have to do that part. And then just to kind of demystify some of the different types of AutoML out there, um, today we're exclusively going to be talking about tabular data. Um, and sort of the more traditional machine learning. Um, but there are lots of other types of AutoML related to deep learning. And 
Um, so if you're curious about, you know, what does AutoML look like in other areas, you can read this blog post that kind of uh, has an overview of that. Okay, so now we'll talk about what is H2O AutoML. Um, so first I just wanna mention what is H2O because that's the context in which um, we'll be working today. So H2O is a library, um, it's the machine learning library. Um, it's really more of a, what I would say, of, of, of a platform rather than a library because it comes with not just the algorithms, but a whole, you know, data processing platform that's distributed and we have um, our own uh, data frames that are called H2O frames that are distributed and really the, the goal when H2O was created back, um, it was about 11 years ago now. Um, Basically, the goal was to make uh, a machine learning library that was fast and scalable, because about 10 years ago is when everybody was starting to talk about things like big data. And um, a lot of the libraries back then were not something that could scale to like millions of rows. Um, so this this was one of the first initial goals. And um, of course, 10 years ago, we already had scikit-learn. Uh, we already had Carrot in R. So there was already in both languages, some kind of unified platform where you could do machine learning on a bunch of different algorithms. So it's not the first uh, platform of its type. You know, both of those predate H2O, but it, the, it's the first that was specifically trying to be very fast and scalable. And actually all the code is written in Java, um, which is a little bit, you know, unusual for machine learning libraries these days. But um, that's one of the <laughs> one of the main reasons that we have the R and the Python front ends is because uh, most data scientists prefer writing in R or Python, um, as you guys probably know. So, um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today is the R API and the Python API. Um, However, because it is written in Java, it's like very easily to deploy these um, models into production as pure Java code, which has some benefits of being fast. Um, it also works on Hadoop or Spark, um, or a lot of people just use it on their laptop. It works the same basically on all these different platforms. You don't have to change your code or anything to get it to work on Spark or Hadoop. So that's another nice thing. Um, but for the most part, unless you have, you know, I don't know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of rows, you probably don't need that. Um, okay, this was the slide that got um, you got a sneak preview of at the beginning. But um, this is this is just something that I'll mention just because we have our own um, terminology in H2O. So there's two things that you should just be aware of. You don't have to know too much about it, just um, that they exist. So we have something that's called the H2O cluster. And all that is is just this uh, basically piece of Java memory that all the data and all the computation is happening within. So one of the first things that you do when you, when you start using the H2O package in either R or Python is you start up the H2O cluster. And basically it's just, um, there's, there's lots of different uh, parameters that you can set for this, like in terms of telling, you know, deciding how big it should be and all that stuff. But uh, you don't really have to worry about it. You just have to know that there is a cluster. It's, it's where all the data is happening and you have to kind of start it every time you use the H2O package. And then the other thing that you should just be aware of because you'll, you'll find out pretty quickly that regular R data frames or pandas data frames don't work with the H2O algorithm. So we have to, you have to convert um, from uh, R or Python data frames into what's called an H2O frame. Um, if you're working with data that's just on in a CSV file, you just import directly into H2O frame. You don't have to convert it into an R data frame and then over to an H2O frame. Um, and the reason that we have this special um, construct is because these are actually distributed. If, if you're using a multi-node setup, um, if you're using your laptop, it's really not uh, uh, actually distributed, so <laughs> it's just the same as a frame, a regular frame in, in R or Python. But one of the advantages of H2O is that you, you could distribute it onto a number of different machines and then the, you know load these very, very large data sets where some of the rows are on one machine, some of them are on another machine, et cetera. But you never have to deal with any of that. You just, um, 
you just have your H2O frame and it works like a uh, data frame uh, in R and Python. Okay, so that's just a little bit about H2O. So I'm just gonna give you a little um, overview of what is, what is the technique that we use in H2O AutoML. So um, essentially what it boils down to is a, a random grid search um, and stacking, so stacked ensembles. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, we chose this approach is because, um, well, number one, I'm a huge fan of stacked ensembles because they give very good model performance. Um, and the reason that we combine that with random grid search is because um, stacked ensembles do really well when the individual models are diverse. So um, one way to get diversity is to introduce randomness. So all the models are, you know, randomly generated and therefore quite diverse. And we have algorithms from, um, or sorry, models with all different algorithms, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and so that's just kind of, th this is a very simplified version of what actually goes on. So there's a lot of logic in the code about like time constraints. And if you have only this amount of time, like how do you prioritize what, what do you do first? And it's it's actually quite complicated, but at, at a high level, it's it's a bunch of different random searches and stacking. Um, so basically what the algorithm does, it does some basic data pre-processing. Um, all the H2O algorithms do basic data pre-processing. And by that, I mean things like, um, you know, if there's certain algorithms that require the categorical data to be one hot encoded, for example, in the GLM or the deep neural networks, it will do that automatically. So you don't have to ever worry, like, you know, if you have categorical data, all the H2O algorithms will handle that for you. You don't have to think about it. Um, and then after we do some basic pre-processing, then we train a bunch of random grids. Um, and I say random grids, they are random grids, but they are very specifically defined. Like we went through like every single hyperparameter and decided, you know, based on a lot of um, expertise, you know, what should the ranges be uh, for each one. And this is kind of the trickier part of, uh, of the, the algorithm or just designing an HO algorithm, sorry, an AutoML algorithm is just how to prioritize and get good results quickly. Because you could do a very large, you know, grid search of some sort and eventually get a good model, but we want to get there as fast as possible. And that's part of the, the, the trick. Um, and then we tune all the individual models. So for example, if the GBMs need to be, we need to figure out the optimal number of trees to use, et cetera, we, we tune that automatically. Um, Oh, I need to update the slide because we have recently switched how we <clears throat> train the stacked ensemble. So rather than just having two, um, which one was called the all models stacked ensemble, which is what it sounds like. It's, it's a stacked ensemble of all the models that you train during the process. And then another one that's called the best of family, um, which is basically taking like the best GBM, the best deep neural network, the best GLM, the best XGBoost, the best random forest, et cetera, and just making sort of a small ensemble based on that. Now we have a different, a slightly different process where we uh, define, uh, I guess what we call, we call them model groups. It's kind of like chunks of work that happen during the AutoML process. So after the first group, we, you know, train a, a few algorithms and then we do stacked ensembles with those. Then we train the second group and then we do stacked ensembles with all of those. Um, so you get kind of these progressive, progressively larger stacked ensembles. Um, and then you get this thing that we call a leaderboard, which is sort of just a, a data frame that ranks all the models with by metrics, um, performance metrics. And then of course we can always export these into production. That's just an H2O thing. So here's what it actually looks like in Python first. Um, so we just import, um, you can just have the H2O library imported. And then if you wanna use uh, the H2O auto malfunction, we can just import that directly. Um, and then I mentioned before, the first thing that we do is we initialize the H2O cluster. So that's what that H2O.init function is. Um, we'll need some training data. So we import, let's say that from a, a file called train.csv. 
And that goes directly into an H2O frame. So that train object is actually an H2O frame. Um, and then there's like a two-step or two-line process to actually train, to specify and then train the AutoML. So, um, so there's lots of different options and arguments that we have for AutoML, but the, the bare minimum thing that you need to do is kind of decide how long you want it to run for um, or how many models you want it to train, or you can combine the two and it will stop when it hits the, the first of, of those two limits. Um, so here we're saying, you know, run for 600 seconds or in other words, 10 minutes. And then we tell it what data to train on. So we point to our training frame, which is called train. And then um, we have uh, the, the X and the Y arguments in the train method are actually unlike scikit-learn where you Y and X are the actual data themselves. Um, in H2O, Y and X are just the names of the, the columns. So Y is the name of the response column the target column. And if you don't put an X there, it will just assume everything that's not Y is a predictor column and just train. But if you wanna limit the number of actual um, columns in your data that are used as predictors, you can specify that as well. And then, so we have this AML object and then there's other um, things that you can do with it, like look at the leaderboard. And then here we are um, in R and <clears throat> So same thing, load the H2O library, initialize the cluster, import some data. And here we just have one function because that's more how we do things in R uh, versus Python with the method, the train method. So here's the same thing. And um, uh, for the most part, there might be a, a few exceptions, but generally all the arguments in R and Python are exactly the same name. And so it makes writing documentation a lot easier. It makes it easier if you use um, both the R and the Python interfaces. So everything should be the same. Um, sometimes the function names are different because of just Python and R conventions, like we just saw here, but all the arguments should be the, the same. Um, and then we have this AML object, and then we can look at things like the leaderboard. So I mentioned um, the leaderboard is basically a data frame. And here we see kind of an example of what a, a binary classification leaderboard would look like. So we would have metrics related to binary classification like AUC and log loss, et cetera. Um, and uh, we, so these, what you see here is just model metrics. Um, we also can tell you uh, we, we, you can basically add columns to the leaderboard. Uh, you can ask it to, to give you extra columns such as the training time for each model um, and the predict speed. So the prediction speed is, is pretty useful because sometimes you'll get models that perform really well in terms of model performance, but maybe they're really slow or complicated. So that might not be a model that you want to use in production. So it's good to have kind of uh, you know, a look at all different aspects of a model. So just because something performs the best doesn't always mean it's the thing that you want to use in your application. Um, so we let you sort by those different columns. And we also give you, um, uh, I think I have a picture on a later slide. Uh, we give you more visualizations about how to compare certain things like prediction speed versus uh, performance, model performance. And you'll see kind of the name of, each algorithm there. So you can kind of tell at least from the model ID what uh, what type of model it is. And in H2O, every model has an ID. And then you can, you know, ask, you know, what give me this model. And then you say, give me model ID, whatever. And then you have the model object, and then you can inspect all the hyperparameters and look at everything about the model. So there's, you know, right, right here is just for, you know, to make it small and concise, we just have the name, but the, you can go and look at all these models and see, you know, what hyperparameters were used. And then if you want to tweak things further, you might, you know, take the top XGBoost model there and then look at what's the learning rate. And maybe you could see if you could try to get it better or something like that. So you obviously don't have to stop with what the models we give you here. You can look at you know, what's doing well and then kind of learn from that and then start to manually tweak things if you like. Okay, so here's just a couple of pro tips. 
Um, so I mentioned this a little bit, but you have to kind of tell AutoML how much work you'd like it to do. So um, it does have it does have early stopping. So if if you it's it's more like max runtime seconds, so the maximum amount of work that you'd like it to do. So if it finds that it's you know spitting out more models and and the overall performance is not really increasing that much over time, like it will stop early unless you tell it not to. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can control the time limit either just purely based on time or uh, by the number of models. So if you want 10 models or 50 models, or if you want it to run for an hour or two hours, um, and you can combine those limits together and it'll stop uh, at, the, at the soonest one. Um, we do uh, five-fold cross-validation by default. And the reason we do that is that's what helps the stacked ensemble do well. So um, you can make stacked ensembles using just uh, like a holdout frame, um, but they work better and they're more accurate if you use cross-validation. And of course, the more folds you have, the more accurate they will be. So um, we cho chose five as kind of like a, um, you know, just the default. So if you want it to go faster and train more models, you can reduce the number of folds and the stacked ensembles might be a little bit weaker, but then you'd get more models for the same time. So then it kind of, you know, might even out to be just fine. Um, <clears throat> so uh, basically another thing you might wanna look at if you're uh, curious about different algorithms, um, you can turn on and off certain algorithms that are um, being used in AutoML uh, using these parameters. Um, so you could also just turn all of them off except for one. So for example, if you wanted to just use AutoML to tune an XGBoost model, you could turn everything off except for XGBoost, and then it would just basically tune XGBoost. So the AutoML function can be used um, kind of just to tune a single algorithm as well, if you like. And then this is just a little, mem you know, if you're not used to H2O, um, you know, training models actually, you know, take space and memory. Like if you have hundreds of models or a thousand models, it could um, use up memory. So you just, you know, if you run into kind of memory issues, then you would just have to increase the memory that you're allowing H2O to access using the H2O dot init function. And um, yeah, it doesn't usually happen unless you have really big data. Um, and then another thing is like, if you wanna just, let's say train 20 models to start and see where you're at, you can say max models equals 20. And then um, you can look at the leaderboard, look at things, see where you're at. And then you can add models to that same leaderboard by just using this argument called project name. You just use the same project name as the first one and it will add models instead of start over from scratch. So. Um, and then just a note, like if you use the same seed twice, it's actually just gonna duplicate the models. So you would have to um, change the seed to get new models. Um, <clears throat> if you like reading papers, there's a, a paper about H2O AutoML. Uh, it's a couple of years old now. Um, and that's the link to it. It just kind of goes in more detail about the algorithm and benchmarks. Um, there's a new benchmark paper coming out. So I'm pretty involved in benchmarking AutoML systems as well. Um, I'm part of a group called um, OpenML and we have something called the AutoML benchmark. Um, and I just found out that our AutoML benchmark paper was accepted with minor revisions to JMLR just a, about a day ago. So we have a new paper coming out that kind of it compares all the open source AutoML tools and does like quite extensive benchmarking on them. If that's interesting to you. Um, here's some links and these are just kind of the main links where to get the docs. So the documentation um, is, you know, it'll give you the code, you know, examples in R and Python. We just have a single, you know, documentation page for AutoML and then we have little code snippets in R and Python. So, um, it makes it nice because we we have a single you know source of documentation. Of course, each each package has their own internal documentation. You know, all the R the R package would have the standard R examples and things like that, and the Python package also as well. 
Um, and then we have a couple just tutorials, just some basic, you know, it's not much more extensive than what I've showed you here. Um, but uh, and actually a lot of that is just in the docs, the code examples are in the docs as well. Um, so um, let's see, I don't know if maybe now is a good time to take a break. I think we were gonna take a break about halfway through. Yes, thank you so much, Erin, for this first part of the presentation. So yeah, you are getting a better understanding of Atomail <laughs> using HTO. So you have interesting questions from the participants. Um, so we have a question from San Mari. He's asking, is the HTO package supported in iOS SageMaker? Um, yeah, so SageMaker, um, for those that you're not aware, is is a um, like an Amazon platform on AWS. So uh, I think, yeah, you, I mean, in SageMaker, you can insert any um, machine learning library into the whole SageMaker pipeline. Um, and you can put H2O in there. And I think if you Google H2O SageMaker, there's, I think it's a blog post by Amazon. Um, I think they sent it to me a couple of years ago. Uh, where they actually have their own documentation about how to H use H2O, if I remember correctly. So um, that would be what I would recommend checking out. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, yeah, you have an, an, another question from Cosima. So uh, if you can maybe quickly elaborate again, uh, what's the advantage of the newer approach of sticking ensembles over the old one? Um, the new approach of using stacked ensembles or yeah. the... Yes. Okay. Um, over not using stacked ensembles? But because you told us about an old approach. So yeah, so I think yeah. what, what you're saying is I we used to only train two stacked ensembles and now we train a bunch of them. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, this is the question. Okay, yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a couple things. I mean... One, it's pretty cheap to train the stacked ensemble because all that really happens there is your, uh, you can, you can, there's something called the meta learner, which is what learns how to combine the output from the base learners to predict the original outcome. And so for the meta learner in stacked ensemble, we by default will use a GLM. So it's actually pretty fast to train stacked ensembles. So I think one of the reasons that we do that is it doesn't really add a lot of time to the whole process. Um, and then there were other things where um, basically the way that we have the logic um, on the back end in in, with, with respect to like early stopping and things like that, sometimes the stacked ensembles were not getting trained. So that was another reason. Um, and then also um, the original goal of having the two different ones, the all models and the best of family was to kind of give you two options for like, you know, use cases. So the, the all models would be probably scoring the best in terms of model performance. But if you have a hundred models then you have a hundred model ensemble, and that can be a little bit complex to put into production. It's actually not that complex, but some people don't like to have so much going on. So that's why we had the the smaller one. So basically what this does is it just gives you a lot more smaller ones that have different combinations of things. And sometimes they do better. Um, and it's, you know, because the best of family is kind of a manual thing where we just pick, you know, best of these each individual algorithms. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best like five algorithm ensemble. It just was a simple, straightforward one. So with the progressive ensembles, you'll have a lot more ensembles to choose from. And some of them will probably be better than if you had just had the, the, the two. Yeah, so uh, here maybe comes the uh, question about um, staked ensembles from Miti. So she's asking what's the best maybe resource uh, or maybe article to, to read about this statistic? <laughs> behind uh, the staked ensembles used in HTO auto ML? Um, <laughs> I would say if you Google my PhD thesis, it's like a really in-depth oh, thing. Yeah. It's actually, it's on my GitHub. It's like GitHub slash Liddell, I think, PhD dash thesis. 
Um, and if you want to really, I, cause actually there isn't a lot of, uh, writing on this. There's a couple of the original papers, um, about stacking, uh, which I didn't think were like that clear. So in my uh, PhD thesis, I actually kind of went over this in quite a lot of detail. Um, and because um, I worked on this type of thing uh, in my PhD as well. Yes, uh, sounds great. So uh, another question from Steve, uh, is there an, an option to auto create new features? Um, Good, good question. So we do have a, an argument that's called um, pre-processing and um, the it's meant to be sort of a, a general thing that we're gonna add multiple types of feature generation um, options to. The only one that we have implemented so far is called target encoding. Um, and we don't have it turned on by default yet because we're still, there's, there's a number of reasons, but um, one of them is one of the things that we try to aim for in H2O is like when we have something turned on by default, we want to make sure we have all the production aspects of that uh, functional as well. So we're still, we're like very close to being done with having that target encoding um, production aspects of things on. So as soon as we get that done, we'll probably turn that on by default. And that would, what that would do is it, it's it's a very useful technique for if you have um, high cardinality categorical features. Um, so like, let's say, you know, postal code or country code or something like that, where you have hundreds or thousands of levels in your category. So if you were to put something like that in AutoML right now, it might have a problem with it. So you could turn on the, the target encoding, um, but we don't have it turned on by default, but the, the argument is called pre-processing. And we'll probably, you know, there's some, um, we have some tickets open to do uh, like date time features. So if you have a date column or a date time column, it will <clears throat> extract some, you know, useful features like day of the week, or, you know, is it a holiday or is it a weekend or uh, things like that. Yeah, sounds great. So last question, could you please share with us the name of the new benchmarking paper that will come out? Oh, yeah, um, yeah, so let's see, um, what did we call it? I think it's just called AutoML Benchmark. Yeah, this is the one shared in the chat, so it's yeah, fine. Yeah, so we, we, have, we have a paper on archive already that's, yeah. um, I think it's the similar to the one that we submitted. So yeah, you should be able to find it on archive, but it will be hopefully um, published soon in GMLR. Yeah, so great. So thank you so much. I think you are done with questions for this part. Okay, cool. All right, so I will go on to the second half of the talk. So so now that we know, you know how to train, train an AutoML in, in H2O, um, there's a couple other things we can do. Um, so this is, I, it's it's not that new anymore. It's a couple of years old at this point. Um, maybe it came out in 2021. Um, we have uh, this these functions that are called h2o.explain. So um, what we've done is we've, we've added a bunch of individual, what we call explanations, which are just kind of like visualizations that are giving you some kind of explainability component. Um, and then we have a wrapper function that will just generate all of them for you. So if you do the h2o.explain, um, you, can, you can use that on an AutoML object, um, a grid, or a single model. Um, and so it'll, it'll give you some different things if, depending on what you put in or what you're trying to explain. Um, but yeah, so that would give you global explanations. So what, what that means is like model level explanations. We also have explain row, which is if you have a particular row of data in your uh, test frame that you want to understand, like why, why was the prediction, you know, 0.7, you can kind of dig in for this particular person or row or whatever it is. Um, you can dig into the, um, you know, what influenced the prediction um, in that specific case with the explain row function. And then we just, you know, use ggplot2 in, in R and matplotlib in Python to, to give you a bunch of plots. 
Um, here's a list of things. Um, so different types of variable importance comparisons, model correlation heat map, um, SHAP is, is uh, another thing that we have just for tree-based models, uh, partial dependence plots, ice plots, uh, residual analysis, and there's two more that we've added actually that uh, one of them is just a learning curve, which is you kind of see how the model is training over time and that will allow you to understand if the model is overfit or not. So sometimes, you know, you can, you get these models generated automatically, but maybe they're a little bit underfit or overfit and you can notice that and then tweak the model yourself. Um, and then we have something called a Pareto front, which I'll talk about in a minute because I have that on another slide. Um, so here's, um, so when we, when we explain an AutoML object, we have uh, actually a bunch of different models. And so we can do different types of comparisons where we uh, can look across all the models that we have. So um, this would be like a way to sort of look at how the different models calculate variable importance. You can kind of, can kind of see trends. So um, different models have different ways of calculating variable importance internally because they use each, you know, the, the way that they process the data is different. And so some models might make better use of certain variables than others. Um, so you can kind of look at different trends and see how they compare. Um, so yeah, so I think that's just one, one different visualization that we can do for AutoML. Um, this would be, uh, this is just a, a, a SHAP summary plot for a single model. So this, this is just another type of thing. I won't, I'm not gonna go into detail about what all of these visualizations mean, um, but let me go back to slides. The, the link at the bottom is, is our documentation, which will explain um, what all these different plots are. Cause if you haven't seen them before, they're sometimes not intuitive. So, I mean, most people have seen variable importance before but probably not a lot of people have seen SHAP plots. So um, you'll need to read about them to see what they actually mean. Um, partial dependence plot is another one that I like a lot um, cause it's very simple to understand. Um, or maybe I'll just say what this one is, but basically this this is a, a data set that's uh, where you're predicting wine quality. So there's a score like from zero to 10 um, in terms of how, what the wine quality score is. So a score of nine is better than five, for example. And just like how much a person liked the wine basically. Um, and one of the variables in the data set is what the alcohol content is uh, for the for the wine. So it's kind of, um, I th think this is kind of a funny plot because basically what it's showing you, um, and it's actually showing the partial dependence plot for all the different, it's actually the like the best um, model from each category. So the best deep learning model, best DRF, et cetera. And, you can, and they all kind of are slightly different, but you can see there's kind of an upward trend. So what, what this is saying effectively is that Basically, if there's more alcohol in the wine, people like it better. So I think that's kind of funny. Um, I, I guess to a point, like around, uh, so that would be like 12%, uh, 13%. If there's more than 13% alcohol in the wine, you know, it doesn't have a, as much of an impact anymore on the mean response, which is on the left. So it's just kind of funny because... Um, <laughs> You know, wine is supposed to be the sophisticated thing, but in this data set, it's showing that this is actually one of the most important things that that people um, uh, are influenced by. So, anyway, it can be fun sometimes to look at these plots and and look at insights for, for your data. Okay, so anyway, so that's that's sort of the automatic explanation um, functionality for, for H2O and we can do that for AutoML or any individual model. So, um, not, it's not specific to AutoML, but there's some specific plots that will do multi-model comparisons like this one. Um, okay. And so now I'm going to just talk about <clears throat> two new software packages. So this is for the R folks out there. Um, the Agua package is a new package, um, by uh, the Tidy Models team. And it's something that we've been talking about for 
years. Um, I think I first talked to Max about it um, at the R Studio conference in 2020, right before the pandemic started. Um, and then, I don't know, it was a wild couple of years. So things just get, you know, kind of on the back burner. But this is finally something that uh, was completed this year. Um, so <clears throat> I'm here on this page, I have a link to the article on, in the Agua package specifically about how to do AutoML, but the package itself is to do any kind of H2O machine learning. So all the algorithms in H2O are supported. Um, so you can just you know, train regular models uh, using sort of the tidy way of doing that, or the tidy models way of doing that. Um, and you can also do AutoML now. So um, as far as I'm aware, this is the only AutoML in the tidyverse. So um, yeah, it's maybe something if you're already using tidy models, maybe you just want to, you know, use this version, um, depends on, you know, what, what you want. Um, if, if you want to use the H2O package, we do ha probably have more stuff in terms of visualizations and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe some of that stuff will come into the Agua package eventually as well. So... This is just a quick example of what this looks like. So um, if you've used tidy models or parsnip, um, this might look familiar. Um, so it's just basically the same kind of things here. So we would do set engine. So that's usually where you specify sort of which package um, you would do or you, um, which package you're using. And then AutoML would be the name of the function that you're using within that package. Um, so setting the mode to either regression or classification uh, is something you also need to do. Um, you can add customized pre-processing steps. So in this one, for example, um, the recipe is uh, first you're sort of defining what, what the data is and what the response. So there's this uh, data set that has to do with concrete. I'm not sure, um, you know, I haven't looked at it in, in depth, but it's a concrete data set. And the thing that you're trying to predict is called compressive strength. And so that's your why. And it's, uh, uh, you know, a regression problem. So it looks like in this case, um, we're regressing y over all the uh, other columns in the data. And then we're adding this pre-processing step that's uh, normalizing all the predictors. And um, you actually probably don't need to do that because uh, H2O will do that for you, but this is just kind of an example um, of something you can do. And then you define the workflow. Um, so you've got them, the workflow, the model, and the recipe. And then um, you've got this fit on the workflow. And so um, basically once you've trained that, then you have a parsnip model object and uh, within there, you've got a bunch of different things, but if sort of the, one of the main things you would wanna look at is the leaderboard. So we have the leaderboard again here and you can just access it um, uh, there. So basically, you know, you'll know, you be able to do everything that you would do in the H2O package, but you can do it in tidy models. So, Oh, one more thing is there, there, there's an auto plot function. So right now um, there's different, uh, I guess, types, but this one is showing um, basically the different algorithms and then showing uh, two different metrics. So we've got um, mean absolute error on the left, or sorry, max, max <laughs> mean absolute error on the left and RMSE on the right. And uh, it, you know, it, it's showing kind of similar trends for these different algorithms. So we're seeing here, um, clearly stacked ensemble is, is doing best and XGBoost is coming in second. And um, the ranking has to do with like uh, what the ranking in the leaderboard is. So um, yeah, so I think in this particular problem, they trained it for a couple of minutes. It generated 150 models or something like that. So um, most of the time, the stacked models are on top. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. And, you know, you'll see this, this ranking is pretty standard. So generally, XGBoost is one of the top performing models. 
then um, <clears throat> the H2O GBM is usually, you know, competitive with or a little bit le less than the XG boost. Uh, we've got random forests, neural nets, and <clears throat> GLM at the bottom, which, you know, GLMs aren't known to be the best models. They're just good for other things. Um, so anyway, yeah, so I, I'm sure they might add to this auto plotting um, function as well to get more features. So, um, okay, so that's <clears throat> something new for the, the R people. I don't know if they've done a meetup on this yet. Um, I'd love to do sort of a more in-depth meetup, maybe for another Our Ladies in the future um, about the Agua package, because uh, there's a lot to, to talk about there other than the auto now. Um, and then this is something, this is really something for everybody, but um, it's this particular app is, is built in Python um, using this, this wave um, framework, which is, is originally in Python, but we also now have an R version of it, which I haven't played around so much with the R uh, version yet, because it kind of got started later than the, the Python one. It's a little bit, um, uh, there's, you know, less less code examples, things like that. So, uh, but I would love to rebuild this app in the R version as well. Um, so just a tiny bit about what is H2O Wave. So it's basically a framework for developing apps. Um, by that, I mean web apps. So um, it can be useful if you wanna make front ends for machine learning projects. So <clears throat> most of you here will probably know Shiny. Uh, at least the R people do. And Streamlit is another package, which is in Python, which is a similar, it's kind of a, a similar idea with, with these. There, there are some key like uh, engineering differences between Wave and, and some of these other ones in terms of uh, response times and things like that. But effectively, it's functionally, it's the same. You're making uh, a, you know, a UI for, for something. And so, <clears throat> Um, so anyway, there's there's now a uh, front end for AutoML made in Wave, um, and it's pretty new. And um, there's a lot of open tickets on it, so there's lots of stuff that I have ideas for that I haven't had time to do yet. And a lot of them are pretty small little tickets. So if any Python person was interested in contributing to um, to a new project that's you know kind of fun and machine learning related, but actually is is not machine learning code. It's it's app code. Um, uh, it's it would be a good way to like learn a new um, tool. Um, so basically it's just a GUI. So AutoML is kind of what, uh, almost a perfect algorithm to have a you know a non-coding front end like a web front end because it's really so simple that you know it could be very easily um, turned into a GUI. And so um, basically, you know, you import your data. Uh, there's, there's two sort of example data sets that come with the app that you can use just to play around with. One is a binary classification and one is a regression. So you can kind of see there's some minor differences between the output on those. Um, so basically after you import your data, then uh, you can select what's your target column or your response column. Um, you would want to indicate whether or not you're doing classification or regression. Um, the little arrow that says, uh, that has data parameters next to it. So that's, that's an expandable thing. So if you can see the one below where it's a stopping criteria, that's the expanded version. So if there's a little arrow like that, it means you can expand it and kind of tweak any of the data parameters. So the data parameters would be things like what's the fold column? Is there a weights column? And, uh, another column, which is, do you want to ignore any of the predictors? Um, you know, maybe you have an ID column in there or something, you want to ignore that. And the algorithms, it comes like pre-populated like that. So if you want to just X out any of those, you can just X them out. Um, the stopping criteria is really the only one that you probably want to mess around with. So um, <clears throat> that's where you say how many models or how long you want it to run for. Um, and there's some other things that have to do with stopping the last three have to do with early stopping and how sensitive do you want it to be to to stop early or do you want to you know kind of make it work really hard before it does that 
Um, <clears throat> and then on the right, I show like the more expanded version of this. So the evaluation criteria, that's just like, how do you, what metric do you care about? So the auto is for binary classification, it's AUC. Um, for multi-class, it's log loss. For regression, I think it's RMSC. So you can change that if you want. Um, but in advance, you want to say which metric do you care about the most because that's how it's going to rank the leaderboard based on that metric. And you can resort the leaderboard based on other metrics, but the original one will be based on what your request is. And then this is the advanced options. So this is just some of the other parameters that you can play around with in AutoML. You could pretty much leave those all um, unset. But uh, yeah, there's other things there that you can play around with. Um, and then of course we have the leaderboard. It gives you a leaderboard. There's a little button to download the leaderboard as a CSV if you want that. Um, <clears throat> it just looks exactly like the other leaderboard. Uh, it also has the extra columns like training time and predict speed, et cetera. And you can scroll over to get and see them all. Um, so here's some AutoML visualizations that we have. So I mentioned earlier, uh, the Pareto front. So um, basically that's just a way to kind of compare uh, the performance in terms of like how fast can this model perform in production uh, versus like the, the accuracy of the model. And in this case, we're looking at AUC. So, um, so Pareto front is not specific to AutoML. It's just a visualization tool that allows you to kind of compare against two axes that you care about and sort of the dots that are on the outer thing called the front, uh, those are kind of the ideal ones that you would wanna choose. So if you cared um, mostly about you know, area under the curve, but you, you also want it to be kind of fast, um, you would maybe choose uh, you know, something on the upper left. Um, you can see um, on the upper right, we've got the stacked ensembles. So those, uh, as you can see, are the highest on the plot. So they're the best performing in terms of model performance, but they're also the slowest in terms of actually making the predictions at runtime. So, you know, maybe you would choose something like that GBM or something like that. And um, the reason you don't see XGBoost on here right now is because I just got a new computer and I got the Mac M1 and we have not um, uh, supported XGBoost yet on the Mac M1, but that's something that we're working on right now. So it's basically not there. <laughs> so uh, that's why you don't see it. Um, and, but hopefully that'll be fixed soon. Um, what else? Oh, and here's like a model correlation heat map. You can see kind of how the models are correlated with each other. So that might help you if you're trying to choose between two models, but you're not sure, um, you know, you can see, oh, this model is actually very similar to like this model. So I could just swap one for the other. <clears throat> and then you can also explain any of the models from the leaderboard just by clicking on them from the leaderboard. Um, then it'll open up this other tab, which gives you some, you know, model explanations. And these are just kind of, you know, what we have to start. There's, you know, some things I'd like to change. For example, I don't think you can read the uh, the labels well enough, so I have a ticket for that. Uh, I think they should be bigger. Um, but here we've for this GBM model, we have the variable importance. Um, we have a learning curve plot for uh, that GBM. So you can see um, on the bottom it says number of trees, um, and then the log loss is on the left. So uh, it looks, you know. If you know how to sort of manually inspect a learning curve plot, you can see we've kind of stopped where the validation error uh, starts to flatten out. And so that's a good place to stop. So this one is around, you know, 54 trees or something like that. So you can see that this, this model is, is tuned pretty well already. You probably don't need to mess with it. Um, and then we've got a, a Shapley summary plot that just kind of gives you more information about the different variables. So there's, uh, there's a couple more things that are just not shown on the slides, but um, yeah, so this is uh, something new and kind of fun to, to play with. And um, if you go to the GitHub, there's instructions about how to, you know, run it locally on your computer. Um, 
So basically you just have to run, you have, you have to have Python, you have to install the H2O wave Python app. And then there's a couple other things, but um, then you just start running it and then it will pop up in your web browser and you can just do auto ML on, on the web browser. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm pretty much done. Um, and here's just some resources and how you can get in touch if you'd like to. And I guess we'll just uh, do some questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Erin. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, we indeed have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, so I will start from the question asked by Martin actually a while back, uh, still to PDP. Uh, PDP. Uh, uh, what is the histogram about? If you could just go back maybe to the slide. Oh yeah, I can go back to the PDP. So what was the question? What, what's the uh, history what the of the histogram? Oh, the histogram. Um, yeah. So that's that's not something in that you would see in all, all PDB plots. Um, it has to do with like how much data is available about each of these um, different alcohol types. So that might help you determine like how accurate certain parts of the plot are. So you can see that like on the left hand side, kind of where the histogram is bigger, that's where most of our data points are. So that part is going to be fairly accurate. And as you go out to the right, we have fewer and fewer data points that we're, you know, learning from. So, uh, you know, you could, you can almost kind of think of it as some kind of confidence interval, like how confident are you about certain parts of the plot? Because, um, you know, the more data that we have about certain parts, we can make stronger um, uh, intuitions about like, does that actually, is that actually how it's working? So yeah, that's something that we added. And I'm not sure if I've seen that on another PDB plot before, but it seems uh, useful because a lot of times you, you have very few examples in sort of the extremes. Uh, great. So the next question is, uh, can you give some average runtime metrics on how long the training and evaluation takes for relatively large data? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that was something that I tried to explore a little bit in the AutoML paper. So we go back here. Um, that's uh, when it, what I mentioned is the scalability study. So I, I went and kind of looked at, um, you know, if I had 1 million rows or 10 million rows or 100 million rows, like how... <clears throat> How does that affect the run times? Um, so you can kind of just maybe, it, it's hard to kind of summarize that because it's it's dependent on so many things. It's dependent on like, let's say how many features do you have? What types of features do you have? How, um, what machine are you running the, the code on? Does it have, you know, 10 cores or a hundred cores? How much memory? So there's all sorts of things that would impact that. So um, it's hard to really give just a general answer. It's just dependent on so many different things. So, um, but if you, um, you know, probably the best thing to get an idea is to just like grab a data set that you are interested in of whatever size and try it on H2O AutoML and then see, you know, on your, your computer or a server that you have access to, um, just see how it is and, It'll yeah depend a lot on the type of machine you're using as well and and how many cores. Okay, great. Um, the next question is asked by Legacy. Um, can you talk about pricing for length of time in a rough estimate? And why? So the question is about pricing. Is that what I heard? Yes. Pricing. Okay. Uh, so. I'm not exactly sure what the if um, what the question is aiming at, but because um, we, you know, this is all open source stuff, so you can run it on any kind of machine that you want. So if you're running it like on Amazon AWS, you know, you could um, you can run it pretty cheaply. Um, so one of the original goals of H2O. Uh, when it was started in 2012 was that, that was around the time when Amazon AWS started to come out and you could rent um, 
CPUs for very cheap for the first time. And so that was one of the goals is to have a library that, that could be run very cheaply um, on Amazon. So uh, um, maybe if that person has some more specific questions about pricing, because um, as, yeah, as I've mentioned, this is all open source, so there's no cost to running it other than, you know, the cost of if you're renting a server, um, otherwise it's just free. And we do, uh, I will mention that we do have something called h 2 AI Cloud. Uh, so that is something that actually does cost money and you can run all this stuff easily on the cloud. Like if you don't want to set up your own servers on AWS and you need something running in production and all of that, like that can more easily be done just by paying some money <laughs> onto the h 2 O Cloud. Um, like a lot of clouds like Google Cloud and uh, SageMaker and things like that. Sometimes it's just easier just to, if you're a business, to just pay to have it all configured and set up. So, um, and you can run the open source stuff. We also at H2O have closed source tools, like one that's called driverless AI, which is another AutoML tool. You can run all that on there as well. A question asked by Dan, uh, do you have any resource for learning how to do probabilistic prediction with H2O AutoML? And does H2O implement conformal prediction, for example? Um, so probabilistic prediction. So are you, are you looking for like sort of like confidence intervals around the predictions maybe? Is that what you're asking about? But Dan, if you want to clarify, please this, yes. Yes. Um, well, <laughs> the answer is that we actually don't have that. So I don't know why I uh, said it leading you on to think that we might. But um, yeah, we don't actually have that uh, in H2O. Um, and it's definitely something that we have had people ask about before. Um, so, you know, we kind of determine what to put next in H2O by how many people are asking. Uh, or if a customer asks specifically for it, we add it in. Um, so yeah, you might, uh, there might be a ticket open for that. We we have our tickets on JIRA, which, uh, no, you know, nobody loves JIRA, but we're actually going to move over to uh, GitHub issues at some point soon. But um, you could look through the H show JIRA um, and see if there's a ticket open for that and maybe if there's any comments on it because I, I haven't heard much about it lately. So um, yeah, it's not on the immediate roadmap as far as I'm aware. Someone is asking if you could put the resources slide back up. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I'm asking the last question for now. Uh, why does Aqua have the Spanish name for H2O? Is there a story behind? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure why they choose the Spanish name. I think it's it's a name that, I mean, it's a word that everybody, I mean, most people know that that word means water in Spanish. So maybe they were just trying to be cute. Um, they, yeah, they didn't tell me a story behind it, but I think I think it was just, um, I, you know, looking for a different word that wasn't H2O or water or something. So it sounds nicer in Spanish. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, just, um, maybe meanwhile, I, I tell you that there's a few comments uh, just uh, saying how uh, inspiring your work is and how big fans of your work uh, people are. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, a lot of uh, my career is is having outlets like Our Ladies and Pi Ladies to share what I'm working on and conferences uh, like Usar or things like that. So um, yeah, it's one of the nice things about working on open sources get to share your work and uh, people get to use it and they can contribute and ask questions. And um, yeah, it's uh, something I really uh, enjoy about the R and the Python community is the open source. Okay, so I think that uh, concludes our event. Uh, thank you so much, Erin. That was really amazing talk. And I think we all enjoyed it very much. Uh, it was also our last, uh, our first,
event <laughs> uh, together with our ladies and Thai ladies, and I hope we can uh, repeat it uh, maybe on site one day again. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I just want to give a big hands up also to Mona and Kusima, and thanks for reaching out to us.